Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast that explores issues in global health and human rights. If there's one recurring theme we can discern across these two seasons of a Shot in the Arm podcast, it is that we've been thinking about what we can learn from the global investments over the last 20 years in the fight against infectious disease. And the sense that this is not a battle that ends at national borders, but a common call to action that affects us all. We have seen an incredible investment in HIV treatment, both in its research and development, and in the delivery of medicines to pretty much every corner of the world. There has been a flourishing of research and development into TB, malaria, Ebola, and childhood diseases, with the creation of partnerships and collaborations that just a generation ago would have been unthinkable, with major players we could not have imagined, and I'm thinking here particularly of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There has also been, if not always as publicly visible, the creation of an infrastructure to detect, diagnose, prevent and treat disease. It is far from perfect, and we know we have huge obstacles to overcome in the better use of antibiotics, as well as incentivizing research and development into newer, more effective medicines. But incredible progress there has been, and perhaps that is most clearly seen in the rapid way the world is responding right now to a new mystery coronavirus that appeared in Wuhan, China in December 2019. It seems this infection first emerged in one of the particular meat markets of the city, and potential infections have been seen in Japan and Thailand. Meanwhile, the US and other countries are beginning to screen travellers from Wuhan at international airports, for example, Los Angeles, New York and San Francisco. This is very much an emerging story, and we will come back to this mystery virus, I hope, in a future episode What is worth noting now, though, is the speed at which the world has started detecting and mobilising, as well as an openness and engagement by provincial and national authorities in China. It reinforces the sense that there has been a profound institutional and philosophical shift in the country's infectious disease response since 2002, when it first faced the challenge of SARS. It also speaks to the level of international collaboration that had been intentionally developed since then, with a network of laboratories developed by the US and partners in 10 countries, including China. In an earlier episode, we met Christina Tato from the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub to learn about its remarkable work to help us detect infectious disease threats more rapidly and effectively. In this episode, we meet Ambassador Eric Goosby, who has been at the forefront of US efforts to build the health infrastructure around the world that is needed to prevent, test and treat. Eric's is an extraordinary career. He became a doctor just as HIV first appeared in the wards of San Francisco's General Hospital in the early 1980s. He went on to co-found the Pangaea Global AIDS Foundation, which I later had the privilege of leading. Also served two presidents, Clinton and Obama. For President Clinton, he laid much of the foundations for the country's public health response to AIDS, implementing the Ryan White program. He was President Obama's Global AIDS Ambassador, responsible for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, which has helped bring HIV treatment to millions. The commitment to Global AIDS stands quite possibly as the greatest achievement in global solidarity since the Marshall Plan, which helped Europe rebuild after the Second World War. Well. We will take a short break, and when we come back, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ambassador Gooseby. Well, it's my great honour to welcome Ambassador Eric Gooseby to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Eric is a friend and a, a dear mentor of mine, and our paths have crossed many times over the years, many, many times. Eric, welcome to A Shot in the Arm. Thanks, Ben. It's a real pleasure to be here. Oh, it's an absolute honor to have you here. So you are California born and bred. Actually, more than that, you're San Francisco born, bred and educated. I am. Could you tell us a bit about your upbringing and what it was like to grow up in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s? Sure. Um, Well, it's funny that we are sitting in your home, uh, which is about maybe a mile and a half from where I grew up in the city in the southern part of San Francisco. I was born and raised here, as were my parents. So uh, we uh, were definitely branded to San Francisco from the beginning. My parents loved the city like in an intense way that uh, I think was reflected to the kids very early on. So uh, I had two very socially active parents. 
uh, very liberal leaning on just about every issue. And uh, it kind of brought that into the house. Our house was a meeting mm -hmm. convening area for my whole growing up. And, you know, fluctuated between city politics, board of education, and civil rights movement. And those were kind of the three themes that came in and out of my, my house. My father was the president of the board of education during the busing period hmm. in San Francisco, uh, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, and really championed uh, the kind of intellectual engagement that the city had to th reach a threshold for before it moved forward with busing. It was, it was controversial here. Because people imagine that San Francisco has always been this liberal lighthouse, but it went yeah. through a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of gnashing of teeth and wrenching of clothes during that period. It it did like much of the country, but it did surprise everyone in San Francisco, especially the natives. Uh, we had uh, death threats, bomb threats uh, uh, to the house. People uh, followed us to school uh, uh, for oh about six months. Didn't do anything, just, you know, wanted my father to know that they knew where their kid was going to school. And uh, and the threats were ugly uh, to scare, mm. but nothing happened. And uh, I think um, the conviction that my father, the Board of Education, but the city leadership at the time displayed was admirable and I think reflected the San Francisco liberal perspective. Uh, nicely with that, uh, and took on the fights, uh, yeah. you know, and moved through the uh, legitimate feelings that people displayed. And I think because of the seven by seven si miles size of the city, there wasn't any big busing distance. I mean, it was all little tiny bus yeah. rides. So, so uh, that argument didn't surface, but every other one did. So. so service was a big part of your family life. Is that what made you made you want to become a doctor? You know, um, service was a big part of my, my life uh, by example. Uh, I was never lectured on it, but my grand, my father's parents, my father, my mother uh, were deeply committed to understanding the issues of the community and uh, weighing in, not kind of standing by and letting it go by, especially during those kind of turbulent times, uh, uh, the civil rights movement, Women's Movement, Vietnam War, all blended together. Uh, my brother was at Berkeley as an undergraduate uh, during the whole free speech movement, the development of the Black Panther Party, and was involved in all of it. So yeah. that was all back and forth just across the bay. So um, so I was immersed in, in the kind of social relevancy, the social evolution that the Bay Area really was going through, um, thinking of it as kind of a, a wave hitting the beach of social ma maturation that was occurring with the United States. A lot was going on in San Francisco that pushed that agenda. Yeah. And so you you trained to be a doctor at UCSF, the mm -hmm. University of California in San Francisco. And I suppose you would have you would have started seeing patients and being, you know, basically coming into the fore of your career just as HIV hit. What was that like? Yeah. So I started medical school in 74, ended in 78, internship from 78 through the residency in 81, and then the fellowship for two years after that. So it was really residency fellowship in which HIV bloomed. It was as if the epidemic bubbled up from the population without us being aware of it until it was in the emergency room. I mean, that's the truth of it. Uh, the emergency room became uh, inundated with young gay men, interestingly, mostly from the East Bay, Berkeley, hmm. uh, a lot of undergraduates, hmm. a lot of graduate students at Berkeley, uh, were some of the first patients that came into San Francisco General. This is 79, 80, so before it really broke. Yeah. Retrospectively looking back on what the admissions were, we were seeing people admitted from probably 78 on. I did an ID fellowship and then went uh, as my first uh, job. Um, San Francisco General had five extension clinics, still does, yeah. into the community. And I was the medical director of the one in Bayview Center Point called Southeast Health Center. Big clinic, a lot of volume, and uh, saw a lot of HIV. 
And it be I began to focus on the HIV outbreak in the Bayview Hunters Point uh, and tried from very early levels on to get community buy-in, yeah. recognition, uh, and try to mount a response that it turns out I will spend years doing after yeah. that. That uh, so so you meant you mention uh, Bayview and Hunters Point, which are still for a, a gentrified city um, areas where there's a big African American community, and you know y you are a towering figure in global aids, but also as an African American physician, and and I I, I guess the question I've been all these years dying to ask you is. Mm is being African American did that did that give you a, a greater sense of ownership of HIV or uh, or did it drive you in some further way and I, I, I put all of this in parenthesis because uh, in my part of a life in part my part of my life where I've been in the United States uh, I've been mentored and uh, driven by some very strong women uh, from the African American community mm. Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the former executive director of CalPEP, Gloria Lockett, mm -hmm. particularly, who mm -hmm. say to me, you know, your job is just to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I'm really interested to know uh, how how that manifested itself for you. Well, it's interesting you ask that because uh, I saw myself as being positioned to be aware of a disproportionate impact on African-American communities, really from the earliest outbreak. Uh, it was very clear to me that the people that we saw in Bayview Hunters Point Southeast Health Center who came down with HIV presented with late stage disease, mm. as did the majority of the people in the Bay Area. It was the late stage disease that we saw first. And it was clear that multiple partners, injection drug use were related right from the very first six months of the outbreak, we figured that it's transmitted by blood yes. secretions. We didn't know about aerosolized spread for really four or five years and didn't have a test until 1984, yeah. Yeah. Uh, experimentally, and it wasn't available in the public until 86. So all of that lack of data and inability to confirm a diagnosis, to not know who's in front of you, allowed communities that were disproportionately hit to dodge it and not accept the fact that yeah. they were being in fact disproportionately impacted and and that's the that's the real threat and tragedy of hiv that it you can get infected rapidly but mm -hmm. you won't know potentially for many years we, right. uh, in this season we had kathy fisher a lawyer who was mm -hmm. part of the um, I didn't know you knew Kathy. Oh Fisher. yes, yeah. Pangea. You oh, see. good point. There we are, <laughs> and we'll come on to Pangea yeah. in a in a minute. <laughs> yeah, she was part of the team that forced the city into implementing harm reduction work, uh, but you were already doing providing the clinical services and were at the forefront of doing that at UCSF and San Francisco General Hospital. Did you have a sense then that you were really pushing the boundaries that, and that's what was required from you? given the virus. Mm. Yeah, we did. We, we knew that this was new. We knew that there were a lot of unknown questions about it. There was a high fear element on part of nurses and doctors caring for those who were infected uh, because of lack of clarity on transmission mode and that it was uniformly fatal, was, was overwhelmingly reinforced yeah. because everyone who was admitted within one or two admissions expired. And these were, again, people in an age group that the medical delivery system was not used to seeing, identifying, entering in care, keeping in care. And all of those, the lack of a diagnostic test, the lack of clarity around transmission, the association with marginalized behavior really pushed down the willingness of the African-American community to embrace mm. this as a threat. And to this day, the African-American community still drags behind in its response relative to the impact it's had on the community. And what was it like being a physician, a healthcare worker in the 80s when there was nothing treatment-wise, essentially, you, you could offer? How did that feel? A lot of fear. Uh, it, it fell in the lap of 
physicians who had oriented to infectious diseases pre preferentially. So the, the first kind of responders, there were more kind of ID doctors in that cohort and others, uh, understandably. And uh, that personality that's attracted to infectious disease is the kind of person that likes a magic bullet. Yeah. Like, we'll give you a course of antibiotics and see you later. It's not like I want to care for your entire decline through, you know, uh, the progression of your disease until you, you, you die. That wasn't that group. But it became the predominant need in caring for the person in front of you. But I think the youth of those in early individuals, mm. our youth as physicians and nurses taking care of, of this person, confounded it further by uh, projecting a lot of our own yeah. needs and aspirations and fears on that individual, seeing and relating to their morbidity differently uh, than an 80-year-old, yeah. and not accepting the decline in the ultimate death and feeling an element of guilt. Yeah. around it that you know i wasn't you know in medicine to uh, not turn people around you know I, i'm a magic bullet yeah. person you know i want the magic bullet delivered and that's it so it required uh and people stratified out as to who could kind of move into a palliative care mode and do it responsibly the hemonc prep you know preference that uh m many academic medical centers put in front of HIV yeah. was because of that, that palliative care into hospice care, you know, uh, handoff is already going on in oncology. So yeah. they were called in and kind of those who felt comfortable stayed. Interestingly, infectious diseases are not what they're as a personality type who's attracted to oncology goes into, but they do a lot of infectious disease because of their destruction of the immune system yeah their therapeutic uh, absolutely and it's funny how so it's funny, yeah. it all comes back and it in is. the in the, the 2020s oncology and infectious disease are it are, is. are is. working so hard together so on to some good news okay. your your career then took you twice to serve two presidents of the USA mm. uh, and in the 90s you worked for president bill clinton Mm. And you had the job both administering what was called the Ryan White program, but also other programs. Your job was basically to make sure that when we had this first treatment cocktail, when we first knew that treatment mm -hmm. was going to uh, to be able to uh, extend lives, if not turn HIV into a chronic disease, your job was to make sure that the federal government provided that to folks in need. Can you tell us a bit about that and what that experience was? Yeah, as uh, a physician responding to HIV in San Francisco, it was all a domestically funded effort. San Francisco gave $10 million a year from their budget through San Francisco General to uh, respond to the expanded need. And no federal dollars were coming in whatsoever for the first decade that HIV yeah. presented itself. It wasn't until 1991 that the Ryan White Care Act was passed Senator Kennedy and our uh, senator from Utah. Um, Blocking on his name. Yeah, oh, me too. He just retired. <laughs> uh, Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch. Uh, that's right. Had, I, I, I really am embarrassed to forget his name for a moment because he played a critical role in making it work in that Senate. Senator Kennedy was a visionary and aggressive on all the right levels, but to get it passed and accepted in the Senate required a dual support from a Republican, and Orrin Hatch, being a very conservative Republican, was just the right match. He related to it because of personal experiences yeah. with HIV and uh, had a close friend he grew up with uh, from childhood who didn't tell him about his HIV status until he was well along yeah. the road. And Orrin Hatch felt what a tragedy if only he'd gotten in care earlier. And that really was the motivation for him to listen. Yeah. And then we were very quickly able to show him uh, the impact that this disease was having in Utah as well, but everywhere in the country. The response was zero. We had to put a dog and pony show together in the 90s, in 1990, that went to 12 or so different epicenter yeah. cities and had testimony from people who were in the city responding. And that 
It's what reached the threshold for the federal government to say we need to do something. Yeah. And that's when we really put together the Ryan White Care Act. We gave the data along with Hopkins and New York because there were no other clinics that were collecting data to make the argument that there was a disproportionate impact on epicenter cities. Yeah. And they needed a bailout financially. And that's when the Ryan White Care Act uh, really came in, made it available to outpatient and inpatient, but mostly outpatient clinics. And the unique thing about Ryan White is it, and I would say that it was my awareness of the role the community had to play out of Southeast Health Center yeah. that made me acutely aware of it. And then on Ward 86, the AIDS clinic at San Francisco General, the community was central to yeah. the care package that was put out, delivered every day. And that relationship is the core of what Ryan White did to other cities that were not kind of, you know, on the cutting edge yeah. of community, you know, civil society involvement. And and that sort of city-based response to HIV is still very much needed and, and very much central today. Your second period of service, and I suppose this sort of matches it quite well, under Clinton, your focus is domestic. Under President Obama, you were the Global AIDS Coordinator, and you oversaw the, the PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which President Obama's predecessor, President George W. Bush, had had established. Although Congresswoman Barbara Lee will remind me that she was one of the first people to propose it, so uh, I, I won't won't forget that. Don't don't <laughs> fight it; it's true, <laughs> absolutely. So, I mean, my first question is: What was it like working for Obama? It was a an honor to work for uh, someone who was intellectually so robust. Uh, but what I loved about him. Uh, was his intellectual honesty. Uh, he uh, absorbed data, what you wanted him to know and, and uh, react to, uh, that you would see delivered in January and you'd see it reflected back in June mm. that it wasn't forgotten. He mulled around with it and it comes back up. Just had a wonderful brain. And his commitment to doing the right thing was uh, gratifying, breathtaking. He th Every time he positioned on a problem, any of the problems that were in my portfolio, he always looked for what was the right thing to do and then uh, how can we make sure that it is uh, durable. <laughs> so he had the right thing to do, highest impact as number one. The second thing he turned to was, is this going to last after I'm not president? Because he seemed to keep you acutely aware of that. One one thing that I think many of us found surprising after his election is that he actually continued with PEPFAR. That oh. there wasn't there wasn't this temptation. Okay, this is this is Bush's initiative. Let's get rid of it. You came in, and your goal was really to make sense of this massive investment, whether mm -hmm. it was directly through the U.S. government or through the newly formed Global Global Fund. So, so what were your priorities for making PEPFAR, a, let's say, an Obama legacy? You know, that's really astute of you to say that because that's just what it was for the President Obama, for Secretary Clinton, who I reported to directly. PEPFAR was run out of the State Department. She was the immediate secretary in the cabinet that I had to work through, my budget came through, had to prioritize with her because she brought my argument to office management and budget in the White House. I would say that the ability to, um, uh, President Bush deserves all the credit in the yes. world for coming up with the idea and pulling the trigger. Yeah, No one was advising him to do that. Uh, the burden of disease was always there, mm. but no one had responded like that. No other country had taken ownership of that response in the way that he did. They had 1.7 million people on antiretrovirals when I came in in 2009. And with President Obama, we took it up in the first two years up to about 5.8 million yeah. with less money. Yeah. And then after that, we're able to move it up into the 11 yeah. and higher. And Debbie Burks has now moved it into the into the teens. Just PEPFAR funded. 
So excluding the global fund, which we keep track of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but often present it as one number because it makes a stronger argument. I think the U.S. taxpayer um, in this generation, really since the beginning of this century, has played such a crucial role in global development, purely, if nothing else, mm -hmm. by allowing people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s to be with HIV to be alive and not just alive, to flourish through having treatment, as well as, of course, the uh, uh, mother-to-child transmission elimination. But yes. that, I think, is, you know, one of, mm -hmm. you know, as, as much as the Marshall Plan was for Europe mm -hmm. in the 50s, mm -hmm. this really is, I think, a mark of American mm -hmm. leadership in the 21st century. You know, I, I really strongly agree with that. Uh, and like no other country, uh, there was no country that made that kind of commitment, that kind of investment, and have sustained it since 2003. Yeah. So uh, the American taxpayer has contributed to dropping the largest morbidity creator and mortality creator on the planet. And I love your association with kept a generation, generations alive yes. so they could interact and thrive to improve the lot of their country, their people, et cetera. Without them, it would have been a very different trajectory. Yeah. So I, I really do think that President Obama brought it to scale. President Bush started it. Yeah. But President Obama's ownership of this is complete because he accelerated, went through machinations to allow for greater impact, allowed me to take off and get rid of interventions, especially in the prevention arena that had no impact, which when I inherited everything was a real problem. So so I, yeah. that was one of the questions I wanted to put to you because a, a potential criticism, no, a real mm. criticism mm -hmm. that many people made of PEPFAR mm -hmm. in its early days, and, and I guess President Bush had to do this given his constituency, but that it focused, it had a focus on abstinence only prevention. And that, and, and that in fact, that actually put uh, young teenage girls at more risk. So, so you had to sort of disentangle yeah. some of the uh, interventions that had less, if uh, not reverse impact. Mm -hmm. Definitely was kind of the, the main focus of my attention in the first couple of years. And starting a PMTCT, a prevention of mother to child yeah. and prevention component. I wanted to strengthen, really start the PMTCT activity. Not criticism. There's only so much you can do when you're standing up a delivery system. President uh, Bush's team, Mark Dybul in particular, was consumed with putting the railroad down. Yeah. I came in when the when the when the cars were already on the track. So it was a I could have numbers that accelerated. Uh, because of that work that had already been done and completed. So it was definitely a stand on the shoulders moment. Yeah. And then, and Mark, of course, Mark Dybul went on to be executive director of the Global Fund. Um, and I suppose there would have been a very brief period when you would have been at PEPFAR and he was the executive, executive director was. of the Global Fund. There was. And I, uh, I cherished the period because I couldn't list all the synergies in thought that we went through as he moved into that position, but it gave him a kind of a global perspective that PEPFAR alone did not complete until he was dealing yeah. with you know 100, 120 different countries' reflections of a response. Just speaking about HIV, because the other the other criticism of PEPFAR, which I absolutely don't accept, but but the argument is that you know PEPFAR was created just at the time that the Global Fund was created. So why the U.S. really should have just invested in the Global Fund? I feel mm -hmm. that that PEPFAR enabled the United States to create some profoundly important relationships, particularly with Southern African countries that I think are going to have long term ramifications. And we've seen the benefit of, you know, the bilateral and the multilateral intervention in HIV. And I, I, I don't know how you feel about mm -hmm. those, those two, the Global Fund and PEPFAR. Well, I see you, your temporal association is correct. 2002, 2003, Global Fund, PEPFAR. But I will say this, that having a bilateral leverage to play accelerated the number of people who got in front of diagnosis, a test for HIV, and who had treatment initiated, without any doubt in my mind. They were synergistic, mm. additive. 
mm-hmm. and in some countries allowed for a, a a different dialogue for the global fund with the country with the bilateral resources of pepfar being the lever that was used to entice greater domestic investment by the country so it got uh to the point where the us's ability to hold a monetary clout over the country was added to the global fund saying you need to put up some a larger percent of this effort or it's going to domino your current portfolio of funders negatively even though it never happened yeah. whatever it was the it was the the potential threat of that that um made people realize it and when the economic downturn had just occurred mm, in 2008 yes. uh if you remember i know you were in the middle of this the countries were thinking that was it the global yeah. funds over pepfar's over they're all going to pull out it's all going to go on us and we're going to have riots in the street yeah Yeah. AU met around that issue. I was at those early meetings. AU being the African uh, the, Union. Sorry, the African yeah. Union and took it very seriously. They were getting ready for this is all going to come down on us. But it facilitated a domestic expansion of resource uh at that time that really has never been repeated since. Yeah. But that's okay. <laughs> But anyway, so 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 now in between these two periods of service, you do something that actually has had a huge impact on my life my own personal mm. life you pat christen who was then the uh, head of the san francisco aids foundation and some other community leaders you came together and formed the pangea global aids foundation and then after you uh, went into government service i had the honor of being your your successor there and uh, you know pangea is you know to borrow peter piot's phrase is truly the mouse doing judo with the elephant it's <laughs> this tiny organization mm. that helped governments in you know rwanda and south africa mm-hmm. particularly set up treatment programs and and i you know and and it's it's really a small group of people mm. based out of offices in san francisco and i i just wondered when you set it up were you and pat not overwhelmed by the enormity of the the challenge in front of you I um saw it for what it was and knew it was this huge unresponded to problem that was only going to get worse. Uh I was very frustrated that a lot of the narrative in 2000, 2002 in that period was that we can't possibly bring treatment to these populations the uh most predominantly hit, the, those who dominated with the disease. 74% of the epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa in 15 countries at the time 2002 there were less than 50,000 people receiving yeah. antiretrovirals is what the literature says i i actually think it was less than that but you know however they got that number most of those 50,000 lived in europe yeah that was with how yeah. i'd say it and the number of people when you came to sub-Saharan Africa especially in the southern countries had you know multiple people in a bed the old four people in a yeah. bed thing was a real phenomena for a decade and all of them were going to die so they were in bed basically to have an opportunistic infection treated with antibiotics that they had available but they were usually dying from something that they didn't have yeah. available and the the biggest was HIV itself but i wanted to prove to the world that you could respond to the complicated treatment of hiv with nurses yeah. and you didn't have to wait until doctors were trained to do this and i wasn't sure i believed it at the time that a nurse could responsibly effectively over the course of the illness make those management decisions especially without a robust diagnostic laboratory yeah. right there yeah. okay and had to see it to believe yeah. it and study it to prove it and and you know subsequent to that um i i think one of the great things about the hiv response is that it has enshrined the role of the nurse practitioner which is having huge impacts and you know following on from your work mm. um we worked with the uh, zimbabwean government mm-hmm. to implement a national hiv treatment program that is really rooted in in nurse practitioners now one of the things i wanted to ask you about it was an urban myth that uh, the first lady of one of the countries that pangea was supporting came to came to visit you in san francisco and abs- was absolutely horrified 
when she came to the offices of the AIDS Foundation to see, how shall I put it, the colorful, various community people and that, that, that this mm -hmm. almost frightened the country away from working with what was the San Francisco model. Is there any truth to that? Yes, there is. You know, we were uh, in 2002, 2003, Sub-Saharan Africa was just embracing HIV as a problem, but were, they were not embracing at all different risk factor groups that reflected who got infected in their countries. Indeed, for another almost decade after that, in, in any of these countries, but in, in particular in this one, you there, there would be an argument that we just don't have gay people in, yeah. in our country, there, so it's not a problem for us, yeah. you know? Uh, and similar for injection drug use, and that adamance was deeply felt. It wasn't just intellectual, it was a kind of social uh, self-perception that you were challenging, yeah. that they really, you know, people you'd worked with for years in in a, in other settings had worked side by side with them these issues had never come up felt very strongly that this isn't a problem and uh were a little insulted when you would bring up risk group mm. you know doing surveillance for risk groups and that wasn't just Rwanda it was every country we worked in and, and including China and Southeast Asia so I, mean, I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to raise China because uh, that was again one of the legacy mm -hmm. programs that I had such an experience helping the country implement treatment mm -hmm. programs and harm reduction programs and and you really brought harm reduction to China's Yunnan province and one of the features of your career is not is not only leading from the front, but you mentor and bring people up. And one of the people you mentored and brought up was a was a young HIV advocate, Thomas Kai, who is now a major <laughs> famous. <act>. Exactly, <laughs> he's the star. And he's the star. Can you tell us a bit about that experience? Thomas was this unusual. Uh, had an entrepreneurial air about everything he did like you would a business, okay? That we need to, you know, have a business plan, get into this uh, clinic, hospital, community, and uh, stand up a clinic that can follow this population, but also funneled, uh, served as a referral site, a staging site for disease, really became a center of excellence in everything that he started. He also developed a electronic medical record yes. that worked in China. Yes, uh, that was simple. You could show someone in a, a couple hours, and that was it. Um, but allowed us to collect data that we would never have gotten in front of, because of his sophistication with his own medical awareness of hepatitis and getting treatment mm. for that. Really understood delivery systems' ability to be a barrier to accessing care. And his orientation from day one was, who are we after? How do they access and get retained in this clinic that we're standing up? Not on day one, but on every day thereafter. And that eye to retention, I think, is what made those clinics really work. And, uh, you know, that has expanded now. It's right across uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, yeah. Laos, Cambodia. It's amazing, it's, really. it's absolutely amazing work. They have drug treatment, needle exchange, and HIV diagnosis and treatment, all three together. Um, and, I mean, really an innovative, uh, at scale, you know, investment. Oh, absolutely. And they, they did it all. You know, almost with one decision, I mean, yeah. it kind of blew everybody's mind. And and <clears throat> he he brought law enforcement officials uh, mm -hmm. over to Seattle and San Francisco, and and I, I don't know, there was a conference going on here, and we couldn't find hotel rooms, so we ended up <laughs> housing them in a bed and breakfast in San Francisco's gay area, the Castro. And we actually it. lost them one night as they went to one of the bars, <laughs> okay. but that's that's for another. We're story. not sure what happened, but we'll we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Um, but now, 2020, you're you're back in the Bay Area. You are a treating physician at San Francisco General. You're back at UCSF. But but what is it like treating patients now in 2020? You know, um, it is. Uh, there are 37 different choices you have for antiretrovirals. There's no one you can't still have the goal of being undetectable as the goal. They do not progress. They're going to die from something else. And 
HIV care has really become how good are you at identifying hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery yeah. disease. The drug juggles are those. The antiretrovirals are refill it, occasional blood test, but not the fights that they were before. So it really has displaced HIV as kind of the number one active issue and puts it down two or three in their problem mm. list because it's really now monitoring and, you know, on a convenience level, you know, I don't want to take three pills. I want to take one pill. Yeah. We have all of those choices now. The pill's too big. We have those discussions. You yes. know? I mean, I was like, you know, the, that wasn't the level we were worried about. We were taking drugs over, as you know, uh, in suitcases. That's right. For so long. And some of them were <sighs> just, just massive, oh. like the size of large you know, candies. Yes. Often, you yes. know, it, I mean, I shudder to think at what we did yeah. uh, to get, you know, people uh, in front of drugs. But One of the other things you're doing, and you've been doing this since 2015, is to be the UN Special Envoy on Tuberculosis. And... I, I got to confess, and, and Mel Spiegelman is going to kill me for saying this, mm -hmm. but Mel, I got to say it anyway. You, you know, I, TB tends to tends to have the reputation of being the sort of slightly unsavory and forgotten stepsister of HIV, and you know, it's still true to today that TB is a major killer, and it's a particular killer in the global south of people with HIV. Can you tell us a bit about what you've done to to you know to keep the attention on TB? So my interest in TB came from the Secretary General to saying, you're finishing PEP, you're leaving PEPFAR, but you have just spent five years with each of the countries that carry the highest burden of tuberculosis as well. You know the ministries, you know the leadership. Could you, as he was exiting the Secretary General position, um, you know, do this and rev up on TB. I came into the uh, SG position to focus on TB, and it's the biggest regret I've got, so could you do this? I wasn't looking for it or thinking about it in that way, mm. but felt that it did make sense, and there already had been a vote to have a high-level meeting in 2018 in September. So we focused on that as the March 2, the kind of goal. And I launched a Lancet Commission on tuberculosis, yes. which really convened the 30 top experts on TB on the planet and put out recommendations on what we should do with prevention, treatment, maldistribution of both diagnostic ability, lab support, et cetera, uh, and gave a comprehensive overview of where we are now and modeled different scenarios out. If we do this, if we don't do that, this is what we're going to see. And and T and TB is one of the uh, one of the areas where the in in terms of biomedical innovation, the public private partnership model has has really had an impact. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a wonderful pipeline coming through, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and urgently, desperately, desperately needed. You know, as I look at it, one of the big failures of the AIDS movement mm -hmm. has been our inability really to grapple effectively with prevention. Mm -hmm. And we haven't mm -hmm. really budged the annual figures. Are, are there things that you feel we should be doing differently? Yes. I feel that uh, we have not approached high-risk groups in a way that effectively changed self-perception to see this disease, HIV, as the risk that it is to survival, and that as a race, there is an agenda, an argument to be made that you need to rally and respond differently collectively mm. across the front of interface with your population and how it interfaces with, this vi interfaces with this virus. You also have the convergence of poverty and lack of medical care delivery system articulation with that population on one side of the equation, and on the other side, a high threshold of engagement on part of African Americans. Yeah. Being one, African Americans don't go to the doctor. They don't do prevention interventions, pap smears, prostate, you know, specific antigen, uh, getting a colonoscopy. African American communities are the worst in taking advantage of that. 
getting diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, influenza vaccinations, the lowest rates, and always have been. And the outcomes reflect it. Mm. And uh, our community, the African-American community, has not owned this. And because of the convergence of many competing needs, HIV is in and amongst a variety of challenges that African-American communities really have to face yeah. that does not um, necessitate riveted attention on yeah. HIV, even though it's killing the population at a rate that's unacceptable, that we could change, reverse, flip, uh, should there be a embracing of this is indeed a threat to our community. Yeah. And, and as you... As you look forward, what are the things, I, I sort of asked the question, what keeps you up at night? But I, I suppose the way I'd ask it is, uh, are there things you feel we should be getting ahead of new pandemic uh, risks mm. or, or health challenges? You know, the thing that keeps me up at night is my growing awareness in HIV, TB, malaria, in non-communicable diseases, you name the disease, of a sustained and growing disparity that go down racial and socioeconomic lines in this country. And that our willingness to accept that as status quo and not aggressively move against it. Within the high risk and highly impacted communities, the African-American community itself and the general community. And I think until that self-perception changes where Black people say, I deserve this, I want it, and I'm not getting it. And I need to understand why I'm not getting it, why my children aren't getting it, and I'll be darned if I'm going to let yeah. that stand. Yeah. Until that happens, just as it happened with HIV, and just as it didn't happen with TB, a constituency becomes the advocacy voice that moves the agenda. Yeah. Without it, it doesn't move. Yeah. Well... We've we've come up to the end of our time, and I I think that is a really salient and valuable reminder to to all of us uh, at the forefront and allies of the of the priorities equity along racial socio economic lines. The, these really are the the things, and if we're really going to you know, there's a there's a wealth, a flourishing of biomedical innovation mm, happening. Mm. And if this is really going to have sense, mm -hmm. it's going to be about how everybody accesses it, you know, how the many access it, not the few. No, absolutely. Our, in an academic medical center sense, it is incumbent on academic medical centers in all the disciplines, but medicine in particular, to monitor the disparity. Yeah, We need to be looking at disparities in the population so we can see them get smaller yeah. and know when they get bigger yeah. and have a alarm that justifies a shift in investment. And uh, until that there's a constituency looking at that number and, and on it, dogging it, people will engage for a couple of years, then wane in their interest, another problem comes up. You need a core group that never lets it get off the leash. Yeah. And I'm waiting for that and don't know just how to uh, support that in well, the African American I've, community. I, I, there are definitely leaders in the community who are doing that. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely one mm -hmm. of them. Eric, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing the wisdom that you've, you've had. You are a shot in the arm. <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> Real pleasure. Thanks you for having me. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thanks to Ambassador Eric Goosby and thanks to our director and producer, Eric Aspera of Newsdoc Media. Thanks also to Brian Ragas and our intern, Will Lansdale. And finally, thanks to you. As always, let us know if you have any comments on this or any other episode, or if you have thoughts on subjects we should cover or guests you'd like to see and hear on the show. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. And remember, you can subscribe and download this and past episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being a shot in the arm and have a great week. Yeah.